Welcome to this presentation called Coercive Autonomy, a paradigm shift in in-service teacher education in England. My name is Sarah Selesnyov. I work at Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. My research focuses on teacher professional development, particularly Japanese lesson study, but also um, teacher engagement in, with research evidence and in research. I also work as co-head teacher of School 360, a brand new primary school which opened in London in September 2021. And I am strategic lead for professional development for the Big Education Trust, which runs professional development programmes for a network of 500 schools across the United Kingdom. Today, I'm going to talk to you um, firstly about the context for um, in-service professional development in England, specifically shifts in thinking um, amongst policy makers, but also to give you a context of what is the normal status quo professional development structure within a standard school. I'm going to talk to you about the policy move towards what has been called a self-improving school system, which draws largely on the work of Hargreaves. I'm going to ex explain the rationale behind this policy, um, so the motivation of policymakers. I'm going to talk to you about how this has been enacted in practice, so specifically the development of schools as professional development hubs in England, what their remit is, what their scope is, and the funding that they receive. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of the professional development offers that these hubs are giving to schools, specifically the early career teacher framework and the recently developed national professional qualifications for school leaders. I'm going to talk to you about the movement towards connecting research and practice, and specifically the work of the government-funded Education Endowment Foundation, but also the work of a grassroots organisation called Research Ed. I'm going to talk to you about how um, policymakers' favoured approaches have infiltrated and constrained the professional development offer in England, and I'm going to give you some examples of these favoured approaches and how they sit together as a coherent whole in terms of an approach to learning. And I'm going to frame this within the context of a concept developed by Greeny and Hyam of coercive autonomy, in which there is an illusion of autonomy um, set within tight accountability and um, decision making frameworks. I'm going to talk to you about the tensions that autonomy has created in the system in England and suggest some ways forward that might enable improved teacher agency and teacher educator agency. In terms of the research context, so what is it that the Department for Education and Academics are calling for in terms of the development of professional development for in-service teachers in London. Firstly, there are many calls for professional development to have a greater duration and intensity, um, reducing the number of one-offs. In practice, um, in schools in recent years, there's been a tendency for professional development to be run through one-off conferences or one to two short sessions um, with no continuity, no extended duration over time. So what people are wanting is that professional development lasts longer and takes place over a longer period of time. Secondly, um, there is a call for a more careful sequence of learning, taking into account prior knowledge and experience. So there have been concerns that uh, professional development does not take into account people's knowledge and experience. It expects everybody to start from the same starting point. And this has been problematic in terms of not just teacher engagement, but also in terms of 
the programme's ability to develop um, teachers from the stage at which they are starting, to build on experience, to build on knowledge and to take learning forward for teachers. Thirdly, there have been calls to build in more time to experiment with and refine new practices in the classroom. So this uh, relates quite closely to the first point about duration and intensity and about having a careful sequence of learning. So what academics and the Department for Education are calling for is that there is a series of sessions over time and there are tasks or um, uh, opportunities within between those face-to-face -face sessions for teachers to take new learning, to take new practices, to experiment with them in the classroom, to see how they work with the children they're teaching, to reflect on that, to refine that, and to come back, share those experiences and take on board some new learning. And so to continue um, with that cycle of learning, reflection and uh, embedding into practice. Finally, there have been many calls um, from across the spectrum for greater connections between research and practice, for teachers to be more engaged with and in research. This is about teachers understanding the research basis rather than what we might call um, uh, reinventing the wheel and also for teachers to be involved in research projects themselves from the point of view that the sorts of skills you might build up whilst involved in a teacher inquiry project or a lesson research project might support you more generally in your classroom practice. So coming up with an inquiry question, gathering baseline and impact data, reflecting on uh, the embedding of a new technique and whether it is working for pupils, tweaking and refining those practices, and also writing up the results of your um, experiments with practice. These are all seen to be useful skills that teachers can benefit from more broadly. What is the school context for um, these calls for policy and practice change in terms of professional development for in-service teachers in England. So just to give a little overview of what is the capacity for schools to enable their teachers to benefit from in-service training. Most primary and secondary schools will have five full days per year off timetable without pupils to experience professional development. They can schedule these days as they see fit. Some schools will bunch them all together in clusters. Others will spread them out evenly across the year. In addition to this, there is usually one hour per week after school. Um, this is for primary and secondary schools. And that would be dedicated to professional development, sometimes run for subjects or age phases, but often run as a whole school professional development session. As well as this, some schools will also have phase, subject or year group meetings, which would happen once a week. These are not usually focused on teacher professional development. They are usually more focused on business management and organisation. This professional development time, this regular professional development time, is usually dominated by input from various leaders from inside the school. So either subject leaders or age or phase leaders or leaders with a particular specialism. They are often bidding for the professional development time. So they will put requests in to senior leaders to say, could I please have three hours of professional development time for a particular focus? And what that has meant in practice is that there is not usually a coherent series of sessions which teachers attend. You may have three sessions on literacy and then two sessions on behaviour and four sessions on special needs, for example. So there's not a coherent programme that takes teachers through the academic year and builds on learning, enabling them to test it out in practice and come back to it and to reflect. 
In secondaries, there's been a criticism that uh, the professional development sessions often expect teachers to engage with general pedagogic development rather than enabling subject departments to get subject specific professional development, which is considered to be important for them. In addition to these blocks of time which are allocated during the school day, teachers can request or be asked to attend external professional development. This might be short courses or conferences or one-off short sessions, either online or face-to-face. -face. This has long been a, uh, a respected practice in schools, but there has been historically little success in making sure that the learning that happens during these external professional development opportunities is embedded in pr the practice of the teachers who attend, but also very little opportunity for these teachers to share or cascade that new learning to other colleagues within their school, which might enable a wider benefit for the school. So these are expensive professional development opportunities, often with quite low impact. As well as this, there are often opportunities for schools to engage in local networks and work cross school on professional development programmes and other um, useful learning experiences such as moderating, teachers moderating their assessment of children's work to make sure that there is alignment. So what is happening within the English um, education system? Where is it moving? What is its direction of travel? And over the last uh, 10 years or so, there's been a significant move towards a what is called a self-improving school system, um, a concept that's developed by David Hargreaves and uh, in his 2010 paper, creating a self-improving school system. And this is a quote from that paper. At its core, the notion of a self-improving school system assumes that much, not all, of the responsibility for school improvement is moved from both central and local government and their agencies to the schools. The system element in a self-improving school system consists of clusters of schools accepting responsibility for self-improvement for the cluster as a whole. A self-improving school system embodies a collective responsibility. In effect, this involves the creation of a new intermediary body between the individual school and the local authorities, which are usually seen as the middle tier between central government and the individual school. What this has looked like in practice has been a fragmentation of the local school system. So historically, schools would be asked to devolve some of their funding to the local council, the local government. Uh, this money would be used to fund a school improvement team who would offer support with special needs, um, and HR, for example, some of the statutory responsibilities, but also offer a full school improvement and professional development offer for schools in the local geographical area. Over the last 10 years, the central government has systematically defunded these local governments and encouraged schools to become academies. An academy school no longer devolves uh, a certain portion of its money to the local authority, the local government. Instead, it uses that money to buy its services from a multi-academy trust, which operates across several different schools, fulfills the same function as the local authority would have done in terms of special needs, HR, um, IT support, and also more specifically, school improvement and professional development. Schools have increasingly moved towards this model. And so what we now have is instead of schools operating in local geographical clusters, we have many schools um, operating within multi-academy trusts, networks of schools that don't necessarily sit in the same geographical area. 
Those multi-academy trusts can be small with as few as two or three schools, or they can be large, up to 45 or 50 schools, and they can be operating in vastly different geographical areas. So a single multi-academy trust could have schools in the north of England and in the south of England, for example. What is the rationale behind this movement towards the self-improving school system? This is a rationale um, that has been led by somebody called Michael Gove, who was Secretary of State for Education between 2010 and 2014. And you can see him here on the screen. At the heart of this movement, um, away from a local-led system is uh, the view that university-led ideas or progressive ideas seen as belonging to the left are being promoted by the universities but also by the local authorities who um, whose local governments might be left in terms of politics. This is a quote from Michael Gove who says that more and more schools are now being rated good and outstanding by the school's inspectorate. But there are still a tiny minority of teachers who see themselves as part of the blob and have enlisted as enemies of promise. The Blob, for those of you who don't know it, was a science fiction film from the 60s. There was a blob, which was a creeping monster who enveloped society and killed people as it went. And so Michael Gove is describing uh, the university and education departments and those who generally in the system believe in progressive educational ideas or ideas that sit on the left and are more liberal um, as problematic and has also described this uh, uh, th these people who would promote these ideas as being um, damaging to children who come from deprived backgrounds who would benefit much more from having a more traditional approach to teacher education. This shift has involved a movement away from the influence of universities towards a more practice-focused, school-led teacher education offer. It has sat alongside, interestingly, calls for teachers and schools to make better use of educational research. This was certainly something that Gove was very much in favour of. And within that, there has been uh, very much a desire from the Department of Education to promote what have been described as favoured approaches. So those that might be perceived as the more traditional approaches to leadership, curriculum, pedagogy and assessment. And I will come to what those favoured approaches look like later on in my presentation. How has this move towards a self-improving school system been enacted in practice? One of the core um, developments uh, that the government has been pushing in order to, to achieve this goal has been the creation of professional development hubs. Schools can apply to become hubs if they are outstanding, as judged by the school's inspectorate, and it has become increasingly difficult uh, to become an outstanding school in recent years as the goalposts for an outstanding judgment have been moved. In order to be outstanding, you have to achieve outstanding across four different areas of practice and you have to, in order to do that, have very, very high achievement results regardless of the context in which you are working. So this has been particularly difficult for schools working in more deprived circumstances. There was a move initially from uh, teaching schools, which have been in operation for a long time now, over 10 years. Each teaching school used to receive £40,000 annually to create their own local professional development offer. So this was very much um, open funding, no restrictions around that, and a very loose reporting system back to the Department for Education. 
It enabled schools to be responsive um, to local need, to develop their own programmes. It did also mean there was significant variation in quality in the system, but it was a very open-ended offer that enabled schools to have agency in terms of developing their own locally relevant professional development programmes. In the last few years, uh, teaching schools were closed and those who did exist could bid to become teachers, teaching school hubs. These have been um, 87 schools were designated by the Department for Education through a bidding process in 2021. And these have received 17 and a half million pounds annually to run programmes for teacher professional development that run right through from initial teacher training to executive leadership level, so executive headship level. Um, so a, com a, a completely um, huge remit, but very tightly controlled in terms of the offer from the Department for Education, which I will talk about in a moment. A much uh, earlier development was the introdu introduction of maths hubs. Again, schools could apply through a bidding process to become maths hubs and had to demonstrate uh, uh, strengths in terms of maths provision. 40 schools have been operating as maths hubs since 2014 and they have received 29 million annually. Again, they have to offer quite a restricted program. Most of their work and most of their budget is allocated to offering maths mastery programs. I will talk a little bit later in my presentation about uh, what the Maths Mastery offer looks like, but this is definitely one of the government's favoured approaches. There is only a very small percentage of their budget allocated towards innovative local based professional development. English hubs are now operating on a very similar basis. Schools applied and were designated by the Department for Education. 34 schools were accepted and have received £11 million annually. They uh, have a remit to push the government's synthetic phonics programme and other um, aspects of government uh, policy, such as the teaching of spelling and grammar in schools. There are other hubs emerging all the time. Music hubs have been operational for five years with a £381 million budget over those five years. Modern foreign language hubs have received £4.2 million over three years. And new hubs are emerging all the time. Recently, behaviour hubs, careers hubs and computing hubs. Those, so this is a definite shift towards that practice-based model teacher professional development led by schools, but within a very tight remit and these schools being handpicked by the Department for Education based on their commitment and their current practices. What do the hubs offer? So this has been a very interesting way for the government to exert control over locally led teacher professional development. All the hubs have been able to offer free training or very low cost training. And they are all restricted to offering government agreed programmes, which have been designed by providers that have been approved by the Department for Education. There is very limited or no scope for innovation or adaption to context or to community. And in this way, what we're seeing in the professional development market is that it is flooded with free government controlled professional development programs. This has essentially reduced the possibilities for innovative programs that respond to community or context um, or are locally responsive. So it's really a flooding of the professional development market with the programs that the government wants teachers and school leaders to experience. And what do the hubs offer? I'm going to talk you through two examples of programs that have been developed recently to be offered through the teaching hubs. 
So the first one is the early career teacher framework. Historically, teachers have only had one year as newly qualified teachers before they can become fully qualified and are, teach, uh, and are treated as standard teachers within the profession. This has been problematic for teachers. Not all of them feel they are fully developed as teachers by the end of that year. So the government has recently published an early career framework. And this is the first substantial attempt by policymakers in England to tackle what's been seen to be a, a fragmented teacher education continuum. They've sought through um, the development of a set of progressive curricula to run a golden thread from uh, initial teacher training through to training for executive head teachers. On the right, you will see there a quote from Gavin Williamson, who was Secretary of State for Education in 2020. He said, these measures will create a golden thread running from initial teacher training through to school leadership, rooting teacher and leader development in the best available evidence. The early career teacher framework has been seen to be positive. It will give teachers, early teachers, more time to learn and to be supported by a professional mentor in their own schools. It has a government prescribed curriculum. Providers had to bid to design programme content and through a bidding process, the Department for Education selected the providers that they felt best suited the programme. These providers operate through the teaching school hubs. Um, so they are locally led programmes with a centrally prescribed curriculum designed by approved providers into programme content. All programmes are currently free and all schools are obliged to provide early career teacher support. So schools that are not going to be buying into one of the approved programmes are going to have to prove that the offer they make to their early career teachers is of an equally high quality and it still has to adhere to the government prescribed curriculum. This has meant in practice that the vast majority of schools are running with one of the um, early career teacher training programmes operating through the teaching school hubs. There have also been a lot of work in recent years to revamp the national professional qualifications for school leaders. There was a very basic offer, um, one for heads, heads, senior leaders and middle leaders, which ran for several decades. This was felt to be very restrictive. It meant that teachers who were strong classroom practitioners would very quickly be identified as having leadership potential and moved out of the classroom into assistant headship, deputy headship, and then headship roles. This was seen to be problematic because it removed classroom expertise from the classroom. There have been more leadership pathways developed as a result of this. And this has worked uh, as built largely on East Asian models. Um, Jensen et al wrote extensively about the sorts of leadership progression pathways that were available within um, places like Hong Kong, Shanghai and Singapore. Um, and these have been built into a new suite of leadership qualifications. So we now have executive leadership, headship, senior leadership and early years. Then we have four completely new pathways, leading teacher development, which helps people move into a role where they support uh, teachers through mentoring and coaching. Leading teaching, which helps people develop specific areas of, of expertise, such as subject or age phase expertise. Leading behaviour and culture, which has been in response to calls in the press and by the Department for Education recently, to improve behaviours for learning in schools and leading literacy, which is seen, it's seen as foundational across the curriculum for both primaries and secondaries. Again, for all of these national professional qualifications, there is a government prescribed curriculum. Again, 
as per the early career framework, providers were able to bid to design the programme content based on the curriculum, and the government was able to select the providers that it wanted to approve to run the programmes. Similarly to the early career framework, all providers operate through the teaching school hubs. And because over the last two years, all of these programmes have been free, it has been very, very difficult for leadership providers offering an alternative curriculum to get any sign up to their programmes. Another huge piece of work has been done to enable connections between research and practice. And this has largely been done through funding to an organisation called the Education Endowment Foundation. This, the Education Endowment Foundation is a charity which was established in 2011 to improve the educational attainment of the poorest pupils in English schools, so those coming from backgrounds of deprivation. It aims to support teachers and senior leaders by providing evidence-based resources to support improvements in practice and improve learning. And on its creation in 2011, the EEF became the biggest funder of schools research in England the EEF has commissioned more than 10% of all known trials in education around the world. And it's done this thanks to £272 million of funding since 2011. The EEF has very much taken uh, as its gold standard for research, the randomised control trial. This is their preferred model and the only one that they use to evaluate um, educational interventions. They have consi consistently stuck to this model of the gold standard, despite recent evidence of the inappropriateness of randomised control trials for the very complex social environment of education and schools. And um, papers such as the Lottie Forges paper which have shown that uh, the EEF's um, uh, interven uh, eva impact evaluations have actually provided quite poor value for money because very few of them have shown a secure finding of impact on children's learning. The response by the EEF has been quite belligerent to this. So in the quote there that you see on the screen, the EEF wrote a response to the Ginsburg and Smith paper saying, we remain convinced that RCTs provide the best way of providing useful results for schools. The EEF have done a lot of, made a lot of positive difference to teachers and to schools in terms of connecting research and practice. They have created a huge database called the Toolkit, which ben benchmarks research impact in terms of cost to um, embed in schools and in terms of months of impact over and above the annual impact you might expect to see on children's learning. And this has meant that teachers and schools have a directory of interventions that they can look at, which is easy to use and understand, can make comparisons and can help them to choose what kinds of practices they might want to implement in their own context. They have also produced a series of easy to read systematic reviews of practices in fields as diverse as literacy, behaviour, special needs, implementation science. These have been very much welcomed by schools, teachers and school leaders as they make a very complex fields of research very easy to read, analyse and digest. In line with this, the EEF has invested 140,000 over the last three years to set up 38 schools as research schools across England. Interestingly, despite their name, research schools, their, their only role is to disseminate research findings. They are not in any way expected to support teacher inquiry projects or to engage teachers or to engage themselves 
in research and inquiry projects. In this way, they've been seen to be quite limiting in terms of enabling school agency and developing practices around research. Why is this problematic? So I'm drawing here from the work of David Godfrey, who talks about three approaches to research engagement. The first one is evidence-based practice. And this is a passive pro process in which teaching approaches are based solely on evidence about what works, which is produced by academics. This is very much the model that the DfE, the Department for Education, is promoting and one which it is funding the Education Endowment Foundation to take on. We will take the research, we will make it accessible to you, and you will use it so that you know what works. The second model um, is one that David Godfrey calls evidence-informed practice. This is when teachers actively combine evidence from academic research, practitioner inquiries, such as lesson study or action research, and other school level data. So it's drawing on a broader data set in terms of what works. It's what works in terms of the research evidence. It's what works in terms of practitioner inquiry. And it's how does this align with the data that we have from our own school context, putting that together to come up with solutions to practice. This second model obviously involves more teacher agency and the, the broader development of a teacher skill set around what are the best ways to use evidence to make a difference to practice in my context? The third level, however, is the optimal level that Godfrey seeks uh, to promote. Research informed practice, when teachers engage in and with academic and practitioner forms of research, using evidence from both to make changes to practice. So this might involve teacher teachers getting involved in participating in teacher inquiry projects, using academic research, using their own school level data, and designing practices to their local context, to the needs of the students that they teach, as well as developing their own skill sets around research, which can really make a difference to practice in classrooms. So the Department for Education's interpretation of research and practice engagement is quite a shallow one, there are many, many missed opportunities within that for teachers to become more deeply involved, have more agency and have a broader development of their own skill set to the benefit of pupils. Another significant development in terms of uh, connecting research and practice has been the establishment of Research Ed. This is a teacher led organisation established in 2013 that aims to make teachers research literate and was set up with a specific goal of um, tackling uh, teachers using what has been called pseudoscience or poorly evidenced um, approaches to teaching and learning. Learning styles was one of these um, in the, uh, around uh, 15 years ago there were lots of schools using a learning styles approach to teach children which was subsequently found to not be rooted in research evidence. Another process was called Mind Gym which involved short bursts of exercise during learning again found to be scientifically not uh, research proven and yet lots of teachers were using this evidence to try and uh, implement um, within their own classrooms and to affect uh, uh, positive changes to children's learning. So uh, this is a, a very interesting model. Um, it's involved locally led and locally organised professional development conferences, which have largely taken place on Saturdays. That's quite unusual for the English education system. Teachers are very unwilling historically to work beyond the hours um, that they are employed to work. So Saturday professional development was historically not very popular. And yet, research ed conferences have drawn incredibly large numbers of speakers and participants in various locations across England. Research ed is supposedly an independent organisation, 
But what's interesting is that it has shown a definite bias towards those traditional models of curriculum and pedagogy, the ones that the government and the Department for Education prefer. A quote from Nick Gibb there, who spoke at a research ed conference in 2017 when he was schools minister, and he described research ed as a grassroots roots, teacher-led revolt against the old order in education. So again, going back to the Michael Gove quote about the blob, pitting the left-wing, university-led, progressive wing of education against uh, the progress of practice-led, uh, traditional styles of education. What are then these favoured approaches from the Department for Education? Just a brief overview of the sorts of things that the Department for Education uh, curricula and professional development programmes are trying to promote. Firstly, direct instruction. Uh, this is a step-by-step, lesson-by-lesson approach to teaching. Often it is very tightly scripted, so it involves teachers following a script for their lessons and follows a predetermined skill acquisition sequence. In essence, it has a very clear set of steps for each lesson, set the stage for learning, present the material and very clear instructions, give the students some guided practice, offer feedback, then let them practice independently, and then have an evaluation or a review of the learning. This model aligns very closely with another preferred approach, which is cognitive load theory. Um, this is the concept of learning as memory and is rooted in the idea that our working memory is only able to hold a small amount of information at any one time. And therefore, instructional methods should avoid overloading the memory in order to maximise learning. So the direct instruction approach aligns very well with this. It's taking knowledge and finding the best way to embed it in children's memory. These both come from the psychology literature rather than the educational research literature. And they are linked very closely to the next favoured approach, which is the idea um, from Hirsch in America of the importance of a knowledge rich curriculum. Just a short quote from Hirsch who says, all human communities are founded upon specific shared information and the basic goal of education in a human community is acculturation. The transmission to children of the specific information shared by the adults of the group or polis. So this is very much the cultural capital model, that there is a body of knowledge to which children are entitled, which is largely factual. It is important that children are taught these facts, that they absorb them, remember them and understand them. This obviously has direct connections to the cognitive load theory concept of learning as memory and to the pedagogical process of direct instruction. In line with that, we have a model for professional development, which has been um, built into those early career framework training modules of instructional coaching. Instructional coaching involving an expert teacher working with a novice in an individualised classroom based context and using an observation feedback practice cycle. So taking, breaking down uh, the concept of teaching into narrow, tight concepts that can be worked on one at a time with a professional coach as part of a feedback loop. Similarly, um, two uh, very specific approaches to the teaching of English and the teaching of mathematics, which I mentioned earlier. So the English hubs are, are specifically um, mandated to promote the teaching of synthetic phonics and professional development for that. This is a method of teaching for reading and writing where words are broken into the smallest units of sound or phonemes and children are taught to make connections between the letters of written text, so graphemes, and the sounds of spoken language. 
Maths Mastery is a model that's promoted by the Mathematics Hub schools. This is a way of teaching maths that um, involves breaking down larger, complex learning goals into smaller, more granular steps. It evolved from uh, mastery learning, which was uh, written largely by Bloom in the 1960s or 1970s, um, but has mainly drawn on South Asian practices for teaching mathematics, and specifically those from Shanghai and Singapore. So what you've got again is this tension between the traditional, uh, the trads, um, who are, is, which is playing out um, as, a, as a battle between good and evil in terms of the government, but also on social media. Watson has written extensively about the kind of the bitter arguments on social media between the trads and the progs. And this push towards the traditional end of the spectrum has shaped the CPD frameworks and curricula and shaped the CPD offer and, uh, uh, and the, and the programme methodologies that are made available to schools at no cost through the vetting of providers um, by the Department for Education. So, although schools are leading this professional de development offer, it's very tightly controlled by the Department for Education. And the situation we therefore have is one that Greeny and Hyam have called coercive autonomy. In their publication, Hierarchy, Markets and Networks, they say, we conclude that rather than moving control to the front line, the self-improving school system agenda has intensified hierarchical governance and the state's powers of intervention, further constraining the professionalism of school staff and steering the system through a model we term coercive autonomy. What this means is that the, although there is an illusion of school level control, there is, there is through significant top down control over funding and program delivery and very tight spend criteria, a position where there is a false uh, sense of autonomy and actually the professional development offer that schools are able to access is very, very tightly controlled. So a reduction in teacher agency a reduction in teacher educator agency within the system. So what is the way forward in this problematic uh, system of coercive autonomy? There are definite tensions here. There are tensions between the need for schools to lead professional development practices and the idea that um, they, need, they need to engage with academics who produce research. There's a tension between the idea that universities are peddling a particular and unsuccessful approach to learning versus the need for teachers to use this research in their practice. How can these tensions be resolved? Here are some suggestions for ways forward for the English system that might help us move towards a greater set of autonomy for the self-improving school system. Firstly, why not expand the remit of the Education Endowment Foundation so that teachers and school leaders are involved in research building alongside universities instead of simply enacting research findings? This could be done through um, setting up university attached schools. Globally, these have been very successful in terms of bridging the unhelpful divide between theory and practice between universities and schools. Secondly, why not expand the remit of the Education Endowment Foundation Research Schools so that they support teachers and teacher educators working locally to undertake research into what works for them in their own context, building on the body of research, but owning it and developing their own research practices at the same time. Secondly, the EEF should consider expanding its vision for high quality research beyond the use of randomised control trials. These are very difficult to operate with any um, effect uh, within the education system, as has been shown by several critics. And also they exclude teachers and practitioners within the education system from carrying out research. Randomised control trials are large, expensive, and difficult to run 
and often require skill sets higher than those of school leaders and teacher research practitioners. Thirdly, the Department for Education should, through its designation of uh, professional development hubs, enable them to engage in local adaptation of standard professional development programmes. This idea of letting a thousand flowers bloom, a new role for the hubs in terms of enabling the agency of local teachers, leaders and teacher educators and developing programmes that work for the context and communities in which they are set. And finally, to fund the development of locally responsive and innovative professional development programmes, giving them startup funding, enabling them to offer places free to teachers and leaders, as has been done with the government approved programmes, so that there is a wider breadth of professional development available to schools and to teachers giving them greater autonomy and agency within the system. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. Uh, do get in touch if you find anything very interesting. <laughs>